Ashley. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> How is everybody this afternoon? Doing good? My name is Saru. I lead a national organization of 130,000 restaurant workers, employers, and consumers working together for better wages and working conditions in the restaurant industry. And we have grown a lot over the last several years because our industry is exploding. A couple of years we passed the 13 million worker mark and now we're about to hit the 14 million worker mark. One in 11 American workers currently works in restaurants. One in two Americans has worked in this industry at some point in their lifetime. How many how many people here ever worked in a restaurant? Look around the room. So we are the nation's largest and fastest growing industry, but we are also the absolute lowest paying. And before I say anything else, I think it's important to think about what it means for the future of our country when the largest and fastest growing industry in America is the bottom of the barrel, absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. It means that right now we're at one in three working Americans working full time and living in poverty. And in just under five years, we're going to get to one in two working Americans working full time and living in poverty. What does that mean for the future of our country, our economy, our democracy? when half of the country cannot afford to eat out in the restaurants that they work in, let alone afford to eat. That fact that we've got the largest and fastest growing industry in America with the absolute lowest paying jobs is due entirely to the money, power, and influence of a trade lobby called the National Restaurant Association. We call it the other NRA. It represents the chains, the IHOPs, the Applebee's, the Olive Gardens. And in doing research, we uncovered that they haven't been around 50 or 60 years, oh no, they've been around 150 years since emancipation of slavery. Because it turns out that tipping as a practice originated in feudal Europe. It was something that aristocrats gave to serfs and vassals always on top of a wage. But when it came to the States, right around the time of emancipation, the restaurant lobby demanded the right to hire newly freed slaves, not pay them anything at all, and have them live entirely on tips, a mutation of the concept of tipping. And that idea of tips as wage replacement for a black population with no wage became law in 1938 as part of the New Deal when everybody got the right to the minimum wage except for the workers of color, farm workers, domestic workers, and guess who? Tipped restaurant workers who were given a zero dollar wage as long as tips brought them to the full minimum wage. And we went from zero in 1938 to a whopping $2.13 an hour, the federal minimum wage in the United States in 2019. I hope you are as ashamed of that fact as I am. There are 43 states in the United States, including Pennsylvania, with these absurdly low wages of two, three, four dollars an hour, perpetuating this legacy of slavery. Not for a tiny workforce, but for the nation's largest and fastest growing industry. And 70% of these workers are, guess who? They are women. They are women working in IHOP and Denny's and Applebee's, struggling with the highest rates of economic instability and poverty and the absolute highest rates of sexual harassment of any industry in the United States. Because when you work at IHOP and Denny's and your wage is $2 an hour, or $2.83 here in Pennsylvania, your wage is so low it goes entirely to taxes. You're living completely off your tips and you must put up with whatever the customer does to you, however they touch you or treat you or talk to you, because the customer pays your bills, not your employer. And when this is your first job, for so many of you who raised your hands, half of American women, this is their first job. This is how they're introduced to the world of work. This is how they learn what's acceptable, normal, legal, ethical. So we've been interviewing older women who tell us, I have been sexually harassed in my current profession, but I didn't do anything about it because it was never as bad as it was when I was a young woman working in restaurants, which means our industry doesn't just have the highest rates of harassment. We set the standard for what is acceptable and normal and legal in the workplace across the economy, and that's not okay. Fortunately, I'm talking fast. <laughs> Fortunately, there are seven states that got rid of this system many decades ago. California, Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Minnesota, Montana, and Alaska all require the industry to pay the full minimum wage with tips on top. And if you listen to the other NRA, you would think we don't have restaurants in California. Let me invite you to visit me. We have restaurants. And in fact, our seven states have higher restaurant industry job growth, higher rates of tipping, and one half the rate of sexual harassment. Because it turns out when you pay a woman a full wage, she doesn't have to put up with anything and everything from the customer because she can count on a wage from her boss like every other worker in every other industry. 
So in 2013, we said if California and seven states can do it, why can't every state and Congress require all employers to pay the full minimum wage and get rid of this legacy of slavery? And we started to win. We won this on the ballot in Maine. We won this on the ballot in DC. We won it in the legislature in Michigan. And every time, the National Restaurant Association lobbied legislators to overturn our wins. And most of the time, it was Democrats who rolled over and listened. And even worse, every time the wage has gone up to 15, as great as that is, outside of the seven states, these women have been left behind. In some cases, like in New York, the tipped workers' wages went down when everybody else went up to 15. We are the negotiating block. We are always thrown under the bus when everybody goes up. And that's got to stop. We got to stand up for each other. Women and women, men and men, men and women, people of color, we have to stand up and end this legacy of slavery. Because what happens when you leave 6 million tipped workers and 13 million restaurant workers out of the minimum wage over and over and over again, and you see Democrats doing it to you, and of course Republicans don't care, I'll tell you what happens, you don't vote. In fact, you don't give an F about voting. In fact, you don't care at all because you see politicians leaving you out and rolling over to the likes of the NRA over and over and over again. We proved it in Michigan. Michigan, we lost to Trump by 11,000 votes. There were 400,000 restaurant workers who mostly didn't vote. Their wage is $3.52 in Michigan. We collected 400,000 signatures, put it on the ballot, and the Republicans knew something Democrats didn't. They took it off the ballot out of fear this would drive working people to the polls, and they made it law. <laughs> They tripled the wages of waitresses in Michigan Tea Party Republicans. And when they did it, they said, don't worry, NRA, we are going to gut it after the election. We're doing this to keep people from voting. We're going to gut it after the election. What did we do? We mobilized 100,000 working people to vote, saying we just want to raise. But if we want to keep it, we all got to tell each other to go vote. And we won. We saw a 300% turnout increase in 2018. 300%. So we know it works. We know it works. We want the governor, the secretary, AG, and they're going to help us actually achieve one fair wage in Michigan next month, ahead of all the blue states. But this year, thanks to Me Too and Time's Up, 16 states introduced one fair wage bills, including Pennsylvania. And next Thursday, the House of Representatives is about to pass the Raise the Wage Act that will raise the wage to 15 and fully eliminate the subminimum wage. The Senate's not going to pass it. Trump's not going to sign it. But it will be the first time since emancipation that either House of Congress moves to eliminate this legacy of slavery. It's a big frickin' deal. And so we are celebrating this and commemorating it and honoring the legislators who are moving this. We have eight or nine Pennsylvania legislators who are here with us today. And right after this, at 4.15, we're meeting at 12th and Arch. We're going to walk over to a Nairbearing restaurant, and these electeds are going to serve any of you who join us. They're going to be a server for an hour. They're going to learn what it's like to be a tipped worker. They're going to hear from tipped workers. We're going to honor the fact that there's a historic legacy about to be created, and we're going to honor the legislators here in Pennsylvania who are fighting a good fight for one fair wage. I hope you will join us at 415 at 12th and Arch. There are blue-shirted folks, Calvin, Sam, and Sig, who are handing out flyers. I hope you will join us. If you can't join us, I hope you will support us and stand with us and get all of us to fight together so nobody gets left behind, because let me tell you, you do that at your peril. If you don't care about restaurant workers or minimum wage, but you do care about reproductive justice, or you do care about climate change or anything else, let me tell you something. There will never be the political will to win everything that we want if you continue to exclude, disregard 13 million workers who do not have a wage, who work two and three jobs, who neither have the time to vote, nor the wherewithal, nor the desire, because they see people leaving them behind over and over and over again. 150 years ago, we made a decision. We said to two industries, tobacco and cotton, we don't care if you say you need free labor to survive. That's not a sustainable business model. Why are we allowing an industry today to say we will not survive unless you allow us to have free labor? Enough is enough. Thank you.